here to talk about misinformation. I'm going to be talking about its potential effects on the internet. And our legal department read my slides today, and because of that, I have to say these words. So, the views and opinions expressed in this presentation are mine and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of AppNexus. Assumptions made and conclusions drawn in this presentation are not reflective of the position of AppNexus. Okay. That means you're in for a fairly interesting ride, I hope. Um, so the short version of this is that our brains, our wetware, our communities are being hacked. Um, I've spent way too much of my time with hackers at the moment, and I recognize this. And that hack is changing the ways that people are using social media and other websites online, and we have a lot to talk about. So. This is what I personally believe, personally, is worth paying attention to. So, oh, I also had to put a This Is Me slide in it. Um, so this is my blog, personal blog, where I talk about belief, I talk about crisis data, I talk about algorithms, yada, yada. Really, I'm just an algorithm and people and data nerd. So I remember being a kid, being interested in cognitive psychology, and not, decide, not being able to choose between psychology and algorithm work and discovering AI, which was both. So that's pretty much where I'm coming from. It's what I've been doing for about 30 years. I've been working on data. I've been working on ideas of belief, both in humans and in machines for that time. And, and that's why I've ended up at NetApp Nexus as a data scientist. That's a perfect place to be doing this. So what we're going to talk about today so I'm going to talk about social engineering. So social engineering is the hacker thing of making people believe or do something that you want them to believe or do. And what's different now is that instead of being able to make individuals or small groups of individuals believe or do things, you're now able, using the social, me social media, you'd be able to use the, the, the internet to make large groups, up to country-sized groups of people say or do things that you want them to. So social engineering at scale. I'm going to look at some of the responses, some of which I've been personally involved into that uh, across different groups. Uh, I seem to spend most of my weekends with yet another group, be it the journalists, the hackers, or other groups that are part of this, like political data scientists this weekend. Um, look at some of the work that I know of from earlier uh, from those 30 years that hasn't gone into that pile yet that might be useful to this. And then talk about my personal beliefs again on how this might change the way the internet works. So, we good with this? Yeah, we're good, fine. Okay, social engineering at scale. Misinformation is a very, very human thing. People have been lying, people have been doing variants on propaganda, uh, they've been doing variants on information operations, uh, similar term for pretty much as long as humans have existed. So the difference, again, is that scale. It's an illustration here of it is just looking at, and I have a clicker, ta-da. Um, I have a clicker that I can't work. <laughs> the numbers up here. So these, these groups here are not random internet groups. These are Russian bought groups online that have been taken down. So th this is a part of the set that uh, Jonathan Albrecht has been putting up online. You can go analyze the tweets, the information yourself. And you've got a huge variety here, everything from uh, black activists through to American Patriot via Muslims and LGBT. And these put out all sorts of interesting information, everything from the Bernie Saunders coloring book through to serious right-wing propaganda across them. But you've got here, um, and there is probably a lot of bot activity, so you can't take these numbers as gospel, but you've got you know, likes and shares, six million here, three million down here. So you're looking at, even if you take out the bots, quite a lot of people have interacted. I mean, it's possible I've interacted with them. I, I need to go back and check. But this also has a real life component to it. Uh, two of these groups had messages to go to a rally at the same place, opposing groups. So you have real-world effects of online misinformations. So th this, is, this is serious stuff. And 
One of the reasons it's serious stuff is that nothing is real on the internet. The internet is pretty much all taken on trust. If you go to my blog, if you go look at my Twitter activity, my Facebook feed, you have to believe that it's me doing it. It is no guarantee. Everything you see out there, you have some degree of belief in the content, some degree of belief in the people, but it's very much completely a belief-based system. And that's fairly location independent. Uh, you don't know where things are on the internet. So it's hard to go check. There, there are systems, um, there's a couple of good ones like Finder who have groups of people who will go and physically check things for you, but generally, generally we've got this huge belief system. And if it's a huge belief system, it's hackable. I mean, that, that's just pretty easy to, 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 to hack, as are humans. This thing here is a cognitive bias codex. Every single one of those teeny, weeny, weeny, weeny little lines there is part of a human being that can be manipulated. So we can engineer people using an awful lot of things. And here's just a few. Here's some of my favorites that, that I see a lot. Um, our recall is terrible. You know, if you look at a car going past a couple of seconds later, I couldn't tell you what color it was. We like to have information confirm what we already know. So confirmation bias, if you, if you feed somebody information that fits their worldview, they're more likely to believe it. Um, mental immune systems, the other direction. If you feed somebody something that conflicts their worldview, quite often they have an immune system response. You see that both in individuals and groups. Familiarity backfire, this is a QT one. Um, so this is the idea of if you keep repeating something, you get a sense that it's more true. Um, a lot of advertising kind of works on keep repeating this thing. Until you annoy the crap out of somebody, and I have sworn once, and probably got in trouble for that. Um, <laughs> so the other nice backfire event is, it, is the idea that if you repeat something, you keep repeating it with a knot involved. People remember the thing, not the knot. So there's a whole bunch of really sneaky ways to get at people. Um, memory traces, you give someone a fact, it fires off a whole bunch of traces across their brain. Um, Gilbert's work on the way that people process false information. If you feed somebody information that they know to be false, they will still take it in as true, then reject it. Traces happened. We're very, 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 very hackable. Uh, and here's one that happens to me a lot, that, that black triangle. I know there isn't a black triangle. I absolutely, totally know there isn't a black triangle, but I see the black triangle every time. If, if that's happening to my visual system, one of the systems that I can objectively point at and say this is not true. Imagine what I'm happening in my cognitive system when I start seeing very subtle ads. And that's at the individual level. We've also got these hacks at community level. So th this is one of my social networks. Um, I can't remember which, but I think there were like lots and lots of crisis mappers and some family and a few odd friends lying around. But especially if you have a trust boundary around the community, you can get a piece of misinformation across that community pretty fast. So these are the things you can use on individuals and groups, and these are some of the channels you can use. So these are channel channels we've been seeing this year. So bots and trolls. Um, bots, pieces of software online that are used to do things like repeat and respond to and amplify or suppress information. Ads. Um, we've seen um, adverts that have been used to encourage or discourage voting. The discourage is particularly um, interesting. And we saw the use of these as part of the Cambridge Analytica work last year. So. The other thing you kind of see in here is, is community. So down the bottom here, we have somebody who's talking about New York and Sharia law based on seeing a hijab on the subway. I, I'm pretty damn certain. I mean, I have followed this person for a while. I'm pretty damn certain they know that's false, but they'll repeat it anyway because it's a good story. So misinformation. And these, having talked about channels, and I am sorry if I'm talking a bit hackerish here, but these are the sort of things that are happening here. The, so we have this separation between miss and dis. 
So I'm going to say the word misinformation a lot. What I actually mean is disinformation because I haven't trained my brain not to do that yet. But um, the difference between them is really intent. Misinformation is the type of information you get in large-scale crises where it's very, very uncertain. Nobody knows what's happening. People share information. It's not necessarily true. It's not a malicious intent. Disinformation is intended. It's intentional. Somebody is trying to tell you an untruth. Somebody is trying to pass that through your network. Uh, and then you have different older forms, quite often used against um, women and minority groups for a long time. So hate speech, we've seen around for quite a long time online. Uh, bullying, doxing, so producing people's documents. Um, a lot of these aren't necessarily false, but they're quite often a slant or a viewpoint or even just a provision of information that perhaps shouldn't be out there. So there, there are different abuses. Um, I think these are called malinformation in Claire Wardle's um, taxonomy, which is worth reading. And then you just have everything else, all the normal stuff. So you're trying to pull out disinformation from this mass of other informations. So there's, there's, there's a lot going on. Um, threats. So we've talked about the endpoints. We've talked about the channels. We've talked about what's carrying on those channels. Let, let's look at the other end of this. Where is this coming from? So again, with the crisis data stuff, but the jokers. So I'm looking at this in, in terms of how persistent the threat is. I, I'm looking at the targets. What are they trying to do with this? I, I'm also looking at things like the reach. So how far are they trying to get this? How far does it go? And how much did it cost them? Jokers, very low cost. Cost more is nothing. You, the, 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 this is the sharks on the streets picture that turns up on every single disaster. You've got flooding, you've got a sharks on the streets picture. And this was a guy in Scotland on one of the recent um, disaster, one of the recent hurricanes. Posted this as a joke, it went viral. Um, so it's one person, they did it for the laughs or maybe the attention. It, it's just happened once, it's reached and gone. Then you've got the entrepreneurs. So you've heard about the Macedonian teens. This idea of people creating web pages solely to attack, track revenue. And they, they are doing some quite interesting things. They, they have training academies going on. They, they are doing A-B testing. So they will test with different messages and different populations to see how they're going to get a better um, return on their investment. I mean, their, their cost is basically their time um, and maybe that training. Target, they want as many eyeballs as they can get. Um, and they're persistent. They keep coming. But generally, they're, they're in it for the money. Um, nation states tend to be in it much, much for, more for targeted political aims. So this one down the bottom, th this is Jenna Abrams. So this is the Daily Beast's um, expose on a troll. And one of the things about um, journalism today is that some of it can be pretty fast, especially celebrity journalism, and journalists will go and look for a good quote. Generally, they'll look in social media for a good quote to put on their, their page. And Jenna Abrams provided lots of good quotes. Unfortunately, interspersed with those good quotes was a lot of right-wing propaganda. So you've got somebody who's been quoted in places like the Times, but actually isn't real, and now has a pretty good following, or had a pretty good following, just on the basis of that quoting. So big reach. It's going to cost of you know, whoever the person or team was putting those things together, um, the target is good, the persistence, uh, nation state is going to keep coming until they, they get what they want and maybe just keep coming forever. So we're, we're really in what hackers call an advanced persistent threat area here. Uh, and then mobs. Um, the last one. And this is a strange one for me. So you have um, generally political groups who generally have a political aim or a political viewpoint that they're, they're spreading. And they, there's a lot of online activity that think 4chan, think the sort of snowballing effects you get. But, but I'm not sure how much of this is the political groups themselves and how much of this is nation state encouragement. Um, because that thing down the bottom, this guy here, about come join the protest at Union Square, that was part of the archives um, for the investigations in nation-state social media 
um, specifically Russian-funded social media. So I'm not, that, that one I'm not sure about yet. The others, the others, they happen, definitely. Um, responses. So having looked at the ecosystem and the points within that system, now let's look at the sort of things that people have been doing this year, specifically this year, uh, as a response to that. So fake labels. Um, this, Irma. Irma was a really interesting hurricane. Not just because of the responses to it, or the fact it came as part of a triple and it, it was a pretty bad year, but also because misinformation figured pretty highly in it. So I find myself personally uh, running a small group who were looking for misinformation uh, connected to the hurricane, who were doing things like the little thing down the bottom here, pushing back. We had some very, very funny Australians. They would push back gently and then they would deploy Australian humor. It was fairly devastating. Um, <laughs> but this came from here, which is an earlier hurricane, which is uh, a group in Panama. And what you generally do as, as a crisis mapper is you see a piece of misinformation, you put the little note saying, hey guys, this isn't, this isn't right. Uh, it's like the same building turns up all the time. In, the same shark turns up all the time. So you kind of get used to seeing the same things after a while. Then you reach out to the people who produced it, saying, could you please take this down? And, and these guys went to the next step, which was, OK, they couldn't take it down. They were starting to see it spread. So what they did was put a fake stamp over the original information and then post that, that fake tag every time they saw the original piece of information, which seemed to be kind of quite useful. Um, the other thing that happened in Irma was um, groups started putting up their own lists of fakes. So news organizations, I think BuzzFeed, put up a list of known fakes, known fake stories. And much more interestingly, the, the government, in the form of FEMA, put up a list of known fake stories. So suddenly you've got, instead of having to like race out and find all of these things, you, you have places people can go look. So you're starting to get a much better response. And these, these are also interesting, crises are also interesting because they seem to have been a proving ground not just for us as responders, but also a proving ground for some of the people producing the advanced persistent stuff. So back in 2010, um, we first started seeing what looked like deliberate injections of information. And Kate Starbird from the University of Washington has done a lot of work on this. It's, it's worth reading her papers, worth reading her discussions of what she's seen since the BP oil spill, where people were seeing messages and were genuinely scared. So the, these are some of the community responses, the fake hunters. Ad tech. Um, misinformation hits ad tech, in, in my humble opinion, um, about three places. So one thing is over at the end user. Bots. Bots view things, they don't buy anything. So there's been some really, really good work in at AppNexus. Um, if you're inside AppNexus, go talk to the SIGINT team because they are doing awesome. If you're outside, there's an interesting article in Adweek, Adweek magazine from them, which is worth reading. So bots don't buy stuff, you want to know where the bots are. Um, on the seller side, those fake pages, um, you end up with a brand safety risk. Um, people are putting up fake information. Does, do those brands want to be associated with it? You'd, you'd like to know what those are. And over on the buyer side, and again, this is my own humble opinions. Um, sorry about all the caveats. <laughs> I do not want to get the company into trouble with this. But on the buyer side, those fake political ads, the don't vote type ads, they, they, that's a brand issue for the exchanges. And you've already seen some of the other exchanges um, having to deal with that. So, ad tech, media and journalists. So this is the credibility coalition. So I'm part of this as well, which is another one of my weekends. Um, so we've been working quietly on how you tell that a piece of information is not necessarily to be trusted. Now note how I'm not saying true or false. 
I'm talking about under dispute. I'm talking about the sort of things that happen behind the tags that are being trialed by different social media groups. So you have on the left of this a bunch of groups that look for misinformation. And on the right, you have a bunch of groups that use that information. And in the middle, we're talking about what are the standards? How do you set a bunch of indicators? How do you merge those indicators? How could you do that not just by hand, but how could you semi-automate it? So we're doing quite a lot of work um, trialing and testing on that. It's, it's worth checking out, and if you're really into it, coming and joining. We could do with all of the, the hands we can get. Um, politics. I also hang out with the political data scientists, the people who work um, data science on political campaigns. I actually managed at the beginning of this year to do a political campaign myself, which was interesting in the way that I saw the use of adverts and media. But this, this quote here, it's, it's a long one, so I've kind of highlighted a few bits. This is a quote about Cambridge Analytica and last year's uh, campaign work. And I started reading it. So it's saying, hey, you've got Facebook lights. Most potent we weapon. So you've got Facebook likes, uh, and then you've got adverts, where you're kind of trying to change people's minds with the adverts, and you're adapting this, and you're getting this spread out. So th this just looked to me like bots. It's like classic bot architecture. It it's, it's like you've got these sensors, which are the likes, you've got these effectors, these things you can do to the world, and there are ways to, to self-adapt and keep self-adapting. So I... Personally, can see several ways you could extend this, and I'm not going to tell anybody until I actually see it. But one of the things that happened with this is, A, it's not good, um, not telling people you're experimenting on them, but also most of the political data people I know, this, it's, it's a great thing to have. Great, you can kind of like target your campaigns really, really well. So there's a whole discussion to be had about the ethics of political campaigning, but I don't think we're going to go back to old school campaigning. I think automated campaigning is probably with us, with us forever. And, and this is one of the things where the responses change what we're likely to need to do. Because as people do this, the detection goes from, is somebody doing this, through to, is somebody doing this in a nefarious way? And you'll see this a lot. You'll see this with the, the idea of likes and advertising. You'll see this with the idea of bots. There is a different level you, you were starting to need to step up to. And that, that is where those indicators start becoming really useful and really helpful. Um, other politics, government level. So this is the UK. Um, Commission looking into what they call fake news. Um, please don't use that title. It's misinformation. Fake news is so loaded now. And it's also just one of the artifacts of that belief hack. It, it's a much bigger thing than just, just news. Sorry, uh, end of rant. Um, <laughs> but, but we're seeing governments, the US, the UK, a bunch of European governments starting to look at this and starting to work out what their responses are. That, that's kind of nice to see. But we're also seeing um, other political efforts. So one of the points of the misinformation campaigns, especially the advanced persistent misinformation campaigns, is to separate societies. You're trying to sow discord, you're trying to sow uncertainty, but you're also trying to segregate people out. Uh, and we're seeing these red-blue things going on. And there are groups out there, mostly based in or related in some way to the peace technology groups who have been working across conflict boundaries for a long time. So conflict boundary, you're talking like Israel-Palestine, um, Cyprus, both sides. So if you look on uh, .facebook, Stanford Behavioral Group, um, they're looking at ways to connect people who are similar, but either side of boundaries. So how do you start rebuilding those connectors? And, and this is important for us because if you break up networks, you lose the reach. You start losing organic reach on networks. So one way to rebuild. One thing I've also been doing this year is spending a lot of time looking for the economic imperatives for pushing back on misinformation because we need more imperatives than this is a bad thing. Um, so social networks. 
So again, using mostly the um, ideas, techniques, and some things that are specific, specific to them, but it's a hard problem for them. Uh, there's some interesting work going on places like Facebook. We're seeing check marks on lots of places. Um, but it's, it's worth watching and worth noting that that's happening. And hackers. Um, hackers have got interested. Um, both traditionally, they're interested in propaganda and the, that mass social engineering. So there have been some interesting talks in places like DEF CON on that. Um, there's also been some interesting analysis as part of the machine learning and infosec community. So I'm, you'd think I actually don't have time to come to work. I'm in too many bloody communities for this. But I do, honest. <laughs> I do have a day job. <laughs> so, um, so you're seeing people starting to look at machine learning um, techniques, just starting to push back much the same way as we saw earlier. Uh, so, for example, Zero Fox has been working on this. And just starting to look at those analyses of influence. So that's all the people that I know of and connect with. And there were more, many more. I've been building an index of projects and papers and communities. And Miss Infocon has a pretty good index, First Direct does. They're out there. But then I thought, you know, we've looked at this problem space. We've looked at some of the current approaches to it. So what else have we got out in the trunk? What else have we got from earlier that we can use here? So one of the things we've got is um, the fact it's not new. Th this quote, I love this quote. This is uh, it's 1858. Don't want to give fake news on the date. 1858, and people are worrying that Telegraph is going to start pushing fake news out there. It renders the popular mind too fast for the truth. <laughs> it's like, bring on the 10-day 10 mail, 10, 10 mail from Europe. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's happened before. Um, big data community. So we used to have four Vs, not three Vs. In fact, sometimes we had six Vs, but they're really only four Vs, because three of them are pretty much all about verification. Um, so you had volume, variety, velocity. But you also had veracity, so truthfulness. So I've been working on things like the back in the day, theme project, looking at what we then called fallacious memes. So there's some interesting work back from earlier on this. There's some interesting work on boosting from earlier from this, all of which could be useful. The um, T-shirt, by the way, that's from the 2010 earthquake in Chile. That's another example of um, a one-shot person. So this was earthquake in Chile. Somebody in America sends a tweet pretending to be a mother and child trapped in Chile. Um, Fire Brigade respond, break down the door, find an elderly couple celebrating the wedding anniversary. Red Cross doesn't get the memo and makes a t-shirt out of it, out of the original tweet um, to funding for response. You, you can't, really can't make this stuff up. Um, and another place where, oh, she says, witching rapidly onwards by mistake. Another place where you've seen similar issues uh, was old school Wikipedia. Wikipedia was a place you were always told never to cite from Wikipedia, that you know, nothing was true because it was all human generated. And they built a pretty good editing process. Sometimes a little too good, but definitely good. Uh, this is just one version of the, the process here, and I think it's one of the older ones, but the workflows for it. I don't think the internet is going to go to every social media feed, every page, every piece of user-generated content has a Wikimedia-style checking flow. But I think we can learn things from that. Um, another place, hackers again, but also intelligence agencies, uh, especially intelligence agencies operating on open source intelligence. So these are people who are very, very used to being deliberately lied to to misinformation, to propaganda, to those information operations against um, other populations. This is one of the classic books. I've left a, a, quote, a note to it in the, the notes um, of the types of techniques they use. So there's a bunch there. There are people already starting to look at which of those might be useful, either automated or really sensibly semi-automated. So open source intelligence, worth looking. And this is my pet project. 
this is stuff I'm not talking about today because, well, hell, it's not controversial. <laughs> but actually, no, I, what I wanted to do, I mean, I'm, this is me doing an aside. Um, what I wanted to do today was to give an overview of the whole field, an overview of what I see as a channels and problem in terms of hackers speak. I, I wanted to do an overview of the work that I know is going, the work that could go. I would be really happy if two people in this audience come out of this going, hey, there's this really cool project I can do. That's why I'm doing it. So moving back to the talk. So pet project. Um, my pet project is looking at belief systems in computers and humans and the parallels between them. So on the left, we have a mildly bleeped out um, couple of headlines, news headlines. And these were about um, systems that learned off user-generated information. In, in one case, a social media site, Twitter. In the other case, um, court proceedings, which are themselves human-generated. Without thinking about the implicit biases in the humans and how they might translate through. Now, these are kind of quoted, and I also work on ethics, or how last year I was working on ethics in algorithms uh, and data, data work. And they quoted a fair bit about ethics, about the ethics of computer systems having some control over human life. There's, there's an awful lot of work in there. But they're also interesting in that if you have a machine learning system on user-generated content from communities, you can start learning about more about those communities from it. So I, I see this as a learning opportunity, not just a, oh my god, it did that. Um, on the right is going back to those 30 years ago and looking at uh, very old school AI systems. So this one, belief networks, classic belief network, uh, which is probability based. Uh, this one, classic expert system, very classic expert system, um, which is all true false based, uh, logic based. And looking at how they match up to human belief systems. So there are different types of human belief systems like Pistis and Doxa. So the idea of people who see things in shades of gray and talk about disgust and beliefs and strongly held beliefs, weakly held beliefs, versus people who see things as true and false, right, wrong, very, very black, white. And these systems kind of model that way. So. This is you know, the, my personal thing of, here's some old stuff that looks interesting. So we've just been through what I think the problem space is, um, the, the responses I know about, some of the things that might be useful within it, and, and then just to the end, um, looking at my, my personal thoughts on what might happen, how this might change the way the internet works, how we interact with it, so this is, this is my speculation piece. It's about five slides worth of, hey, look, this might be an interesting thing to go and explore. And my personal feel is that we're at an inflection point uh, on the internet. Um, weirdly enough, today, Zainab Tufiki um, tweeted about you know, Web 1.0, where we'll put out information, Web 2.0, you've got social information, the interactions are user-generated, and Web 3.0 being ill, misinformation, all that crap. Two squares. Um, my feel is that Internet 3 is likely to be a product of our response to all that crap. And that we have a very interesting situation where we've understood that we have information flowing very much the way you might see water flowing, um, and it goes a long way, and there are mechanisms you can use both on the humans and the machines, and there are bots contained within that, and we have to find a way around that that doesn't involve just shutting everything down and walking away. So it, it really feels to me like a similar response on the network level as people with network computers had when the first internet, big internet worms came out. So it, it's just, you know, this, this is where I'm coming from. And things that are already happening. 
So people are taking holidays from the internet. They're taking holidays from social media. They're checking out. So no eyeballs. They're, they're just go away for a bit. Uh, you're also seeing these divisions, uh, sort of red-blue here, but you, you're seeing these separations of networks. So each of these changes the structure. Certainly on the social side, um, those reaches are different, those engagements are different. So people side, bots, bots are not going to go away. People are marketing using bots online. Um, in fact, they're marketing using bots online for their marketing, which is kind of cute. Um, so again, the problem isn't now, at the moment, people are looking for bots. So it won't be go find the bots, it'll be find the bots that are doing the things that you don't agree with. Um, and you don't agree with is an incredibly loaded term. So again, back to how do you build those indicators, how do you build those systems where you're not talking about true, false, you're talking about under dispute. So again, with the upper level. Um, we're going to have to live with them, even the really cute ones. Luckily, there's a whole bunch of theory on that too, um, autonomy theory. So this idea of, from robotics, of how you mix humans and robots in teams. So all the different levels, you have these ideas of responsibility levels, you have these ideas of tasking levels, of interactions, and culture. So I think we're going to get an interesting internet culture shift from this. So this, this, this would be my core cool research project. I would love to go play with this, but I'm kind of busy. Um, <laughs> so if that, if that one person in the audience, please, please do it. I, I'm also thinking there's likely to be a new industry for me. I'm already seeing a lot of people working on misinformation systems, uh, especially things like the bot detectors. Um, this, this is the Lumascape for online advertising. And I'm expecting to see a similar thing happen. Um, so maybe a Lumascape. And these are the things I think will probably be in it. Just from looking at the system starting now, I will probably be very, very wrong. Um, much as I was probably very wrong about in the data science industry cha changes. But we will probably see an explosion and then an implosion down to, down to a few players. So bot detectors, they're, they're, they're a given. They're already happening. Um, so bot detectors, outputs, responses. Um, the fact checking, the indicator work. Some of that could be semi-automated. Um, there's already checking groups out there. So that's another piece of the puzzle. Uh, I don't have an, actually a real name for this, so I just call them silo bakers. The, the systems that people are building to cross those silos, can reconnect groups. Um, personal filters, we're already seeing people who are, who've got blockers, apps, which block any new accounts or any accounts without enough friends, which is gonna be bad news if you're late to the internet, but. Um, so you're seeing this filtering, personal filtering going on. Um, SMSEC, already seeing a little bit of this. So MLSEC is that machine learning and information security. I'm, I'm expecting to see a sub-discipline of how do you protect um, social network environments, network environments, even down to individual connection environments. Uh, but looking at that social media scale, looking at that belief level. Um, we, we, we've worked pretty much in the nuts and bolts up to now, and it's, it's kind of nice to go up a level. Um, and then those stamps, dampeners, um, I haven't seen anyone automate that yet, but that, that might be an interesting thing to start, start seeing. How do you start affecting back? And probably in the, back to the survival of the truthiest, I'm expecting the Herfindahl Index. So I don't expect the internet to look the same next year. Not quite. Um, but that, again, is very personal opinion. It's probably a lot more resilient than I think. But I would expect a lot of sites to start tightening up on their inventory quality. I, I would expect, I mean, in fact, what we're already seeing, the big social media sites talking about this. So. We may see some discrimination between people who can afford the checking and people who can't. So we'll, we'll, see, we'll see what happens. I mean, probably going to be a much, much bigger effect um, from net neutrality and whatever the hell happens there. So we'll see. 
And I'll just leave you at the end with the data science ladder. So this describes different types of data science ranging from um, basic stats. OK, here is a bunch of numbers. What can you see in this and patterns through to prediction? Um, here are a bunch of things that happened. I've given you a new input. What do you think is likely to happen? But I think we're probably sitting around here, around the Y and what's happening with maybe a little bit of not so much how can we make it happen, how can we make it stop for things like the bot, bot attacks. I, I suspect if the smarts go into things like the Cambridge Analytica loops, we'll probably end up having to build our own adaptive systems to deal with that. And that gets us into pure hacker territory. Um, that's, that's me. And I think this is the point at which I say, does anyone have questions? Are you still awake? <laughs> um, could you go a little bit deeper into net neutrality and how that relates to what you're talking about? I'm really, it's not necessarily part of this. It's tangential, but it does have an effect that they could both interact with each other. Um, OK, this is very much with my personal hat on. OK, just making that very clear. If you start um, making the internet uneven, if you start making deserts in internet access, you end up in similar si situations. So I, I came originally from development data science. So I did a lot of work in places where there was no internet, or there was very patchy connection, or, and people still manage to interact and be part of the world, but it is beyond frustrating trying to get to a page that's been designed for a fast load um, with lots of images on. When you're sat in the middle of, well, sometimes in the middle of a jungle, but other times basically just in a cafe in a place that just hasn't got that connectivity. And that's enough to make people just not go to those places. So you're likely either to see a resurgence in low band sites, where it really matters you're going to start building low band sites. And there's a bunch of stuff on that from development. Or you'll see dampenings across this. So again, this is under the we'll see. I, I'm not going to really heavily look into net neutrality until that's, that's done either way. But yeah, it's another fun thing to deal with on the pile. Hi. Um, some people have compared uh, fake news to spam. So in the past, spam was a huge problem, but then it was fixed, and technology helped to, to fix spam. So some people think that there'll be technology that'll fix fake news in the future, and it won't be a problem. Um, what fake is news is not just fake news, though. Um, so misinformation is sometimes a lot more subtle than that. You're talking about hyper-targeting. You're talking about trying to change people's minds rather than just trying to sell them mug boots. Mm -hmm. It's fairly obvious that someone's trying to sell you boots. Not so obvious if they're trying to slowly shift your political opinions. And so really not obvious if you think it's one of your friends who's doing it. Mm -hmm. So actually, maybe this is where misinformation versus disinformation is important. Um, so do you think it could fix disinformation, but not yeah, information? I, 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 I said at the front that I always use the wrong word. I just or both. They're deliberately one. malicious information. <laughs> so, OK, so, do, so you don't think that it, it's equivalent to spam? Like, it, that'll always kind of be a problem. That's not a way. Technology is not going to fix. Some of it is. Some of it could be filtered, which is what some of the personal filters, what some of the bot, bot checks. Some of the um, indicator should be fairly easy. I mean, if you get something that looks like a New York Times article, but it's coming from the wrong address, and the byline's wrong or missing, or then those are things you really want to be suspicious of. Other stuff is just going to be a lot more subtle than that, especially advanced persistence stuff. Especially, I think what you're saying, especially if it's shared by relatives and friends and things yeah. like that. Uh, it's, yeah. Again, it's the, this whole thing is based on trust and belief, and we have to sort that out. But. I'm curious if you are aware of uh, connections or links from this work, in, particularly into education and kids. Um, Quite a lot of it. Yeah. Um, so one of the things that came out of Miss Infocon 
was this idea that um, educating children is a lot more valuable than educating adults. You, you get them when they're young. And there were a couple of very, very good projects. And the Coral Project, for example, that, they're working on educating um, kids and teens. Um, a lot of stuff targeted it at people who will be of voting age for the next big election, that, that level. Um, one of the problems there, of course, is being in a system where the government is in a position to reduce the amount of funding available and the types of education available to do this. So there, there are issues, but there are definitely groups and projects working hard on that. Yes. Thank you. Uh, one thing you mentioned was uh, in that whole Irma thing where people started fighting disinformation with, you know, posts that, you know, the spam. Yes, the stamps. So they were fighting spam with spam. Mm -hmm. And that leads to some interesting dynamics. Have you thought about that, where oh, there's yeah. like bad spam, good spam, and the spam detectors in the middle? Well, that, that's that why all? it's the thing of last resort. First you try to take it down, first you try to counter it, and then you go, okay, guys, <laughs> this isn't working, our bots hit your bots. But um, I don't think it'll hit to our bots, hit your bots either. It's, again, lots of thinking to be done, lots of testing to be done. Mm -hmm.